Good morning, everyone. It's Natalie Alicia Goldberg with The Gold Standard, and I'm here with one of my nearest, dearest, best friends, Maya Zrati. Hey, Maya. Hi, Natalie. How are you? I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. So happy to be here with you. And I just want to tell you all about this gorgeous lady you see on our show. Maya it was working as a corporate executive and as a passionate philanthropist. And then she had an aha moment when her failed marriage taught her that even with her strong personality, positive can-do attitude, she had to start from square one. And she felt like so many women, a deer in headlights, clueless about dating after divorce. From that life-altering turning point, Maya made it her mission to learn how she and other women would be strong and professional while at the same time attracting and sustaining the right fulfilling romantic relationship. She went on to become a certified rules dating and relationships coach and the number one rules coach in the entire country. She's been named a National Association of Professional Women, Woman of the Year, a Your Tango dating expert, has made numerous TV appearances, and is a sought after expert on the topic of dating, particularly for professional women. She coaches women, single and divorced, on how to stop the self-sabotaging behavior that keeps them single, remove the desperation and frustration from dating, weeding out Mr. Wrongs, and teaching women to date with confidence and success because everyone deserves a happy relationship and a happy life. Maya, thank you so much for being with us. I'm so excited. So Maya, look, you know, it's not easy to get out of the depths of despair that so many women feel either through going through a divorce, which today in our pandemic world is at an all time high or finding Mr. Right from the outset and saying, I want to start a family, especially because the dating scene is very different today. It's very different today. It's very hard for people to find love. People are not connecting as much organically as it used to be. Let's say you're in college, high school, and just meeting new people every year. And then afterwards going on to your professional life and or sports or organizations or different things that you're doing. Um, and people are not putting themselves out there that way. With technology, there's so many beautiful things about it, meaning you have the access to many more people, with the apps and the websites, but at the same time, it's put a big hindrance on relationships because people stay home and they look at their phone or if they're out, they're looking at their phone going like this and they're not looking around to see, oh, is there somebody here that's attractive or they're not noticing, maybe someone's looking at you. And if your head is always stuck like this, looking at the phone, you're not gonna give yourself any opportunity to meet somebody new. So it has been, challenging and different and you have to learn you, you have to learn how to talk in person and you have to learn how to speak online in the digital realm and it, they're very different uh types of conversations so it's so interesting because you know i had a dear friend on last week and he's a plastic surgeon single guy and i'm asking him like what you know what are you he goes you don't understand i'm trying but i take a girl out and she puts her phone like this on the table, and it's over from the time it started. Why, because she puts her phone on the table, that bothers him? Yes. Okay, well, and his, where's his phone? So I guess it's away. So I, I, Maya, so what are you telling women as far as you know, phone behavior? Put it next to you on your seat, or if you need your phone out, if you're a mom. So for me, I'm a mom. I keep my phone sort of, nearby my purse and I don't look at it. I just need to hear a certain ring because I have a certain ring set for my daughter. And I think that all moms that are dating should do that because that way you're not listening to every single ring. You're listening for the one that's from your kids. And it has to be loud enough to go above restaurant sounds. For single girls, leave your phone. Just put it in your purse, put it next to your lap. Don't leave it on the table. Um, I think it's funny though, it is a double standard because men leave their phone on the table and they'll start looking down at their phone. Like, you know, they'll be like, mm -hmm, when they're bored with you all of a sudden. So it is a double standard. <laughs> but if you, if, you know, 
try to come with your whole self, put the phone to the side, especially when you're just meeting someone for the first time, a date zero as we call it, or the first date. After that, date number one, the official. Um, the date zero is a coffee, a meet and greet. It's not gonna be this long three hour date. It really shouldn't be because you wanna leave something more for the person. You're just trying to weed out, is this someone I wanna go out with again? And on the first date, the first official date, you also don't you know, leave your phone if you're a doctor or you're expecting a phone call or you're a parent, say, I might be expecting a call from my children or work, but other than that, leave it. Don't look at it because it is rude and you're not giving your best self. It's so interesting. So the phone really has become both a place you find the person on the different apps and such a barrier once you're out with that person. And I think what you said was brilliant, like lay out the expectations and the respect. Like, look, I am a mom. I need to know that my kid is okay. And I think people obviously respect that. If they don't, you know that's the wrong person. I've been on dates and I have said, hey, just so you know, I'm waiting for my daughter to get home. The babysitter's gonna bring her home and she always lets me know when she's there. So I'm just, as soon as she texts me, I'm gonna put my phone away. Just That's like that. you said, share the information, give the respect, there's nothing wrong with it. And the other person appreciates it because they don't think that you're just like looking down and dodging their call, dodging the date rather. So it, it's amazing to me how dating has so changed. And I didn't know about this date zero, date one, but intuitively, you know, I never want to go on a long date when I was dating with a guy because like, what if I hated him and I needed to escape, you know? So I always, and I teach my younger sisters, keep it short and see if there's something there. So I guess that is the right advice. It is, it's so much better. You can go for a walk, you can go for a coffee. Coffee's always great because that way, if you don't like the person or if you're bored or you're just really not into them, you can say, this was great. It was so nice to meet you, grab your coffee. It's, I really have somewhere to be right now. I didn't expect to stay for so long, but thank you so much. Always be polite and sweet, but the date one should be the one where you're saying, okay, I'd like in your mind where I'd like to see if I wanna go out with this person again two or three times. I love that. And you know, my, when I had met, met my husband, I was in LA. I literally had like an hour before I had to get on the plane. I had a date with another guy for a coffee. Ooh. He sucked. I was <laughs> out the door in seven minutes and thank goodness, because I only had a half hour to then meet my then husband. And exactly. Now he's your husband. So it was perfect. I love that you had back-to-back -back dates. That's so great. <laughs> that is so great. You know, listen, we're busy women. We got to chop, chop it. <laughs> correct. Correct. And you know what? I don't think that people should just take like mercy dates because whatever, but people that haven't dated in a long time, accept some dates, learn, learn how to date, practice so that when you do meet the guy that you like or the girl that you like, you're not like, um, um, you don't want to be a bumbling idiot. You want to have a little practice to know how to end it, to know how to leave the person wanting more you know you don't want to date where the person where they like leave like a stomach ache like oh okay i got a little too much of that person now you know where the candy's so good in the beginning then you eat the whole bag and then you're regretting it 20 minutes later because the sugar overload on your stomach so you don't the dating is the same concept little by little by little it's so tell us about the rules right so you don't want to overload a person and what should be you know the the right way that we go about building this relationship if the person likes you and they're pursuing you, they should ask you out again. They should say, I had a great, it's very easy. When someone likes you, they say, I had a great time. It was awesome meeting you or great to meet you or I enjoyed meeting you and I had a very good time. I'd like to take you out again. What night are you free? Or are you free Friday or are you free Saturday? It's very black and white. If they like you, they ask you out. They want to see you again. If they don't like you, you'll be a little confused and you'll be waiting for the person and you don't want to be waiting for the person. Sometimes in the beginning with a brand new relationship, it can take two weeks to get it on track because you're brand new to the person. They might not have expected to like you. You might not have expected to like them and they might be dating someone else or have things going on, work, kids, life, etc. Same with you. You may have a busy travel schedule for work. So don't rule the person out within the first two weeks. Give it a chance. If they're asking you for a last minute date on a Sunday night, hey, are you free? And it's like nine o'clock, that's very rude. You're not gonna say, oh, that's rude. You're just gonna say, no, I'm not free. I'm really busy, but thanks. So you never wanna be rude to the person, but you need to love yourself and understand what your boundaries are and say, hmm, that person didn't think enough of me to ask me in advance or even notify me to say I'd like to see you again. So it's just the little things that help you realize 
what's going to be a good relationship maker or not. So kiss on the first date. What do you think? Um, yeah, you can kiss on the lips. I don't think it should be a long, drawn out, massive movie, epic kiss, just because you want to also leave them wanting more and a lady should be a lady always. Um, but you can kiss. I, I, you know, I don't think it needs to be over the top, you know, meaning you need to pull back a little bit. And with that, right, today in our world, it's the conversation of like, do you offer to pay? Do you not? I no, mean, okay. no, a lady should never pay. A girl should never pay. Um, the person that's asking you out on the date should be paying for you. It's just polite. It's manners. It's the proper thing to do. It's courtship. You want to know that someone values your time enough to pay for your chicken and salad or your drink or your coffee. You want to know that you are worth it. You don't have to, romance is different. The romance rules are very different than the professional rules, than the f rules with friends. You know, when you're going out with your girlfriends or your guy friends, split the bill. If you're taking someone out for the, their birthday, okay, treat them for their birthday. But when you're going on a date, you want to be dated. You want to be thought of in a romantic um, aura and spotlight and you want someone that would like to take you out if someone offers to split the bill with you or says that they want you to split the bill you split the bill and then you decide really the guy didn't want to pay for or, for my chicken eh, all right maybe they're not going to be such a great partner after all you know cheap is not great in romance or dating just saying cheap is not great anywhere it's, it's really not great <laughs> She ends up being expensive anyway because you mess it up with something cheap and then you have to pay more. One hundred percent. And Maya, what I love what you said is the difference between a professional relationship and a date. And this is something I personally had to learn because I had a big professional practice, and, and thank God it's great. And but when I was dating, I would bring that a type personality. I'm the boss to the date. No. No, it didn't work. <laughs> Leave that for work. Leave that for work. Don't bring that, don't bring that side. You need to wear a different hat when you're going on dates and even in a marriage and in relationships, you need to put on a more feminine side and say, okay, let the person come to me. I'm not going to be aggressive. Relationships are not aggressive. The, the pursuer is the aggressor. The recipient is feminine and elegant and receiving. So you have to be open to receiving. You don't want to be bossy and telling someone what to do. Men get that at work. Women get that at work. They don't want to go on a date to be in an aggressive, like, I'll pay, I'll split the bill. It takes the romance away. It doesn't make someone want to come toward you and be like, wow. You know, people want to, when they're pursuing someone, they want to take care of that person that they like. They want to treat you. So let's now say, okay, we did a great job dating and we are a married couple. What are the tips and tricks to keep that spark alive? Oh God, it is hard. Marriage is hard, even in the best relationships, because you're taking two people that have had two completely separate lives, separate worlds, separate upbringings, separate interests. Even if you have things in common and share interests, you're, you're just two completely different human beings and you're merging them together under one roof in the same bed. And it's, it's as personal and as intimate as it gets. And I wrote down a few things that are critical for people to remember in a marriage. Number one, you are worthy of love. And you need to put that in your mindset. And you need to love yourself because when you're in a marriage and you're constantly like tripping over yourself to do, do, do for the other person and you're never saying, wait, is this working for me? It's never going to work. You're constantly going to be butting heads. You need to be very clear on who you are as a person and what your boundaries are. But that typically happens as you're getting into the marriage because you've said I do with a person that you know or hope you know will share those same things with you. But in marriage, compromise is key, patience is critical, and showing up as an excellent partner, whether you're the husband, the wife, whatever type of spouse, you need to show up as an excellent spouse and you need to be clean and organized and you worked hard in the dating for them you were more challenging and sweet in dating for them to get you. But when you're married, you need to be, you need to show up for your partner if you want them to show up for you. It can't just be, well, I'm married now and you're going to do this and you're going to do this and you're going to do this. It doesn't work that way. You have to swallow a lot, zip the lip and keep it quiet and really show up for your partner. No criticizing. Ever. 
Hmm. And it's so hard. It's so hard because you want to be like, that was stupid, or you're an idiot, or you don't look good, or you really smell. It, there's a whole other language to marriage. And it's, it's, a, it's a big one to learn. And it takes a practice, a whole lot of practice. Wow. Because, you know, the criticism, right? I mean, that is something people are hurling at each other, especially pandemic world. We're stuck inside 24-7 together. A lot of people are not making it through. Da um, I don't know if you know the actress, uh, Kristen Bell, I love her, and her husband, Dax Shepard. They were, were always seen as such an amazing, great couple, Hollywood star and starlet, and they even said, now that we've been spending 24 hours a day with each other uninterrupted, we got on each other's nerves and we had some pretty big blow up fights. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what they said. And they had to learn, meaning even the best couples, nobody was spending the 24 hours a day together. So now that you, with the pandemic that that brought people working from home and people being on top of each other and you realize you're like, oh, I didn't realize that that's how they brush their teeth or I didn't realize it takes them so long to get dressed or I didn't realize that they read the newspaper and they just leave trails of the newspaper print all over the kitchen, the dining room, because you're not home. You each go to your own things or you each have your own lives. So the pandemic really showed people it's a make or break. Are you going to stay together? And are these things little issues? Issues, or are you ending it because you cannot stand each other ever again? And if they are choosing that this is not the right relationship anymore, how do you gracefully exit to maintain a level of camaraderie and repertoire between the parents and the children? It's hard and people forget to do that because there's always one party that's more hurt in the divorce. And the, the, the extra hurt party wants a little revenge or wants something. And when you get to the negotiation process, it can be very painful. So you just have to say, what is my goal? My goal is to end a relationship with dignity, divorce with dignity. And it's, it's easy to say, but it takes work to do. And you're not trying to go for the jugular in a divorce. You're not trying to ruin someone's life. You made a child together and you have to honor that. And you have to say, am I gonna make my kid go back and forth 50, 60, 70 times? back and forth between two different households. Now the children are the ones that suffer because they're the ones that are sleeping in a different place, adjusting to two new homes, adjusting to different schedules. They have to see their mother's new partner, their father's new partner. So it's a lot. The divorce can happen for the adults, but the children are stuck in it for so long. So you have to make it as good as possible and swallow your pride and be quiet and really, really, really just Focus on what's best for your child if you're divorcing with children. If you're not divorcing with kids, figure it out, split quickly, divide up the assets, and move on. Be generous, and move on. Done. What Don't do be cheap in a divorce. That's another thing. Don't be disgusting in a divorce. You were married to the person. You made a child with the person. Don't hold their feet to the fire. You know, just give and go. And work hard and make it back triple. 100%. What do you think about prenups? I think they're so important. I think prenups just, people may hate them. I don't. It takes the guesswork out of later. Then you're not having to divide up. I've seen people that were married for 35, 38, 40, 50 years, 20 years, no prenup. Then you're starting from square one. Every asset, every single thing. In a prenup, it's done for you. You're getting this, you're getting this, that's it. Is there alimony? Is there child support? And people that attack prenups, I mean, come on. You signed the document. You had a chance to not sign before you got married. And you, can, you could have amended it in your marriage as well. The person that is the, you know, just be generous. That's all I have to say. Just be generous, no matter Absolutely. what. I think and we share the same critical. disdain for these litigants who want to, you know, they sign and then they say, well, I didn't really know. Come on. Give us a break. I mean, if you're really young and you don't know and you don't have a team of people around you, but you hope the person you're marrying is going to be wonderful and generous to you, even in a divorce. And people, be generous and be nice and be good. God will bless you. Don't be disgusting in a divorce. That's all I have to say about it. Do not be disgusting. Maya, you've left us with so much great advice. If you can give us your number one tip. Love it's yourself. Beautiful. Do not be desperate. Do not act from desperation. Time will tell and time heals all wounds. Give, if someone's not responding to you right away, if someone's not getting to you right away, if someone's not doing what you want them to do in that moment, take a deep breath, step back, 
go do something else. And it's hard to do, but set timer, go do something else and don't attack the other person. So important. And if you feel that you're attacking, you can say, I'm sorry if I just attacked you in that moment. I didn't mean to, I'm very worked up. And these are the reasons why. When is a good time for you to talk? And the person that's receiving that information should recognize their partner is feeling amped up and say, what can I do? I'm here to listen. It's a two way street on both sides. I love it, Maya. And it's always, always, always amazing to be with you. You've given us such sage advice and just love you so much. And you know, you have inspired me. So thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me.